Good evening. Good to see you again today and to, to be able to talk today about uh, the work of the Lord in South Africa. When we give these reports, and we're, we're talking about the work that we do because you support us, but the work that we're doing is only, we're only able to do this kind of work just like anybody in the kingdom because of what God does. And the point of these types of reports is to give God the glory. Now, I'm not going to use many verses tonight. I actually only have one. Uh, but I want us to, to look at this because I, I, I know sometimes people like me ha can have questions about, well, you're getting the church together and then just talking about people and things you're doing and you're not talking about the scriptures. But this is something we find done in the early church by the apostles. And in Acts 14, verse 26 through 28, it says, From there they sailed back to Antioch, this is Paul and, and uh, Barnabas, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a considerable time with the disciples. This is a scriptural thing to do, to get the church together and talk about what God has done in other places. And so when we talk about these things, I want us to make sure God is the one getting the glory. We're not anything special. God is. And uh, so we want to talk about some of these things. Just to, to, to start off, one of the questions that I get a lot is, what does a normal week look like or what does a normal day look like? Haven't gotten that so far on this trip, uh, but, but I, I'm going to go through a little bit of what a normal week looks like. So I have uh, classes that I teach most days of the week, unless it gets canceled. Uh, but on Sundays, I preach at one of about five different congregations. Uh, we rotate. So I'm hardly ever at one congregation more than, you know, once in a row, <laughs> which isn't in a row. But uh, usually there's no back-to-back -back at, at the same congregation. Sometimes there is, especially in a shawi, uh, but that's very rare, just maybe a couple of times a year. Uh, on Mondays, I have an online class in the evenings uh, with a couple of families that I'm able to, to do. Uh, we used to do those classes in person on Tuesday nights, but when we got back to South Africa, COVID was still going on, and it was just, everybody was used to doing online stuff, and it's about an hour, a uh, little over an hour drive to, to get out there, so we started doing that. Uh, on Tuesdays, I go about an hour and a half to a place called Makassini. It's in a rural area to teach some classes out there, or a particular class out there. Mostly there's non-Christians in that class now. Uh, on Wednesdays, I teach the midweek study for the church in Ishawi, where we're members and where we live. On Thursdays, I teach about a 20-minute online class along with three other preachers. So each one does 20 minutes each. Uh, and on Fridays, I teach young people's class in Ishawi. On Saturdays, there's a, a family in Ashawi that we have classes with. So it's not a packed schedule. It's generally just one class a day. Uh, but you have to study and you have to do other things as well. So it, it's, a, it's a steady schedule. Sometimes these classes get canceled and we have a day off. But, uh, but the, the congregations that we mainly work with, there's about five of them. And uh, the first one is Ishawi. That's where my grandfather is. He's 93, uh, almost. Next month he'll be 93. Uh, he's been there since 1985, I think. Started the congregation there. Uh, so there's around 50, 55 members now, I believe. We lost some during COVID. Uh, some died, some left. But... Um, but a lot of them have come back uh, at this point. And 
Uh, so we, it's right in town where we live, uh, and so that's, that's one that, that we work with regularly. Another one is Known Goma. Uh, it's about a three-hour drive away. I've been working there since I moved to South Africa. There's three of us who take turns from Mashawi going out there. They can't, they don't have their own transportation, and Sunday mornings it's hard to get transportation through public taxis and things, so uh, they need somebody to pick them up and take them, and they're spread out. Uh, even the ones in Makosini go, and, and they, they're members of the church in Nongoma, and that's about an hour and a half into it. You know, so they're about an hour and a half from the church that they worship with. But uh, this particular day was a good day. We had most of the people there, uh, and even some, a couple of extras when I took the picture. So it's not always this many, uh, but around 10 to 15 is usually what, what there are in Nongoma. And there's some, some great people there. Uh, in Pine Town, it's a very small congregation. It's about five now. It's two families, and uh, the family on the, the left side there, the Luckrajas, they, uh, they have other children, but they've grown up and moved out. And, uh, and so now it, it's down to five people. Uh, they had another member who passed away, uh, but uh, we try to go out there once a month to encourage them, and uh, the groves are the ones on the right. Moses in the middle there is actually from Ashawi. He just happened to be there that day because he was working in Pine Town, uh, and so when he's in Pine Town, he worships with them, but uh, he's not, not usually there. There's another congregation I didn't get a picture of this time, uh, Unit 9 in Chatsworth, and there, there's about 30 of them, uh, and you know, they've, uh, I think they, they've grown a lot. Uh, there's, there was another congregation, I don't really know what the differences were in the teaching, <laughs> but uh, it was close by. Uh, some people that had left them and started another congregation, that has moved somewhere else. And some of the people from there have joined up with the Unit 9 Church. One of them is named Joel, and he's a young guy. He, he's doing a lot of the, the teaching and preaching now, and they, they seem to think he's, he's really a big help. So uh, that's, that's good. We don't go there every month because uh, they do have some men who are pretty capable, but it's useful, especially if they have particular topics that they're not as well studied on, uh, to have somebody coming in and, and teaching about that. Uh, then there's the church in Uvongo. It's about a three-hour drive uh, south of, of uh, us, and um, they've, they've joined together with another group that was in the same, same place that was associated with the institutional structure, as a lot of people put it, uh, there. And you know, they, they have a lot of contacts with the school in the town of Benoni that's supported by all the churches and caused the big split uh, back in the 60s or 70s. Uh, and so anyway, that, that's not their cross in the background. This is a rented room, uh, and uh, this just happens to be in the room. Uh, but there on the far right, is Kanyile Majola. He's one that does most of the Bible teaching uh, when he's there. He works a long way away, but he lives there. And in the far left in the back is uh, Michael Krunewald, and he does the, pretty much all of the preaching there. And uh, he's newer to it. Adam Kendallball used to preach at this congregation. And when he moved back to the States, Mike had to take over and just had to grow and, and learn to preach. And he has. Uh, he's come out and studied with us some, and, and he, he's really worked on it. Uh, and, and we try to go out there. Mzwandile Gazu and I try to go out every once in a while and encourage them. So we don't go every month, maybe every three months, something like that out there. Uh, give them a little bit of relief. From, from that work. Uh, but, but these are really good brethren there, and uh, 
it seems to be a growing church. They're, they're, they're growing in their understanding, growing in, in numbers a little bit as well. With the weekly classes that, that I do, there's the Tuesday night class that's mostly with the, the non-Christians. Uh, it's not a lot of people, but we meet in the home of one of the Christians from that area. He's not there. He lives in Durban, but his mother lives there. She's not a Christian. She's happy for us to come and teach, and she's always in the classes. And uh, one of the older ladies from next door comes, and uh, she's, she has a lot of biblical knowledge. She's with, you know, I don't know what denomination exactly she's with. Uh, I think it's Apostolic Faith Mission, but anyway, they, they're, they're listening, but it's, you know, I don't know what it will turn into. The, the young lady on the far right was uh, invited to come by one of the Christians from that area who's now moved up to Johannesburg for work, but she keeps coming. And she brought a young lady with her the other day, and that young lady, I just happened to be teaching. I, I was teaching a series on the gospel, and that day I preached on the one baptism, and that night she decided she wanted to be baptized. So... We baptized her, and then she never was able. Uh, the next week, miscommunication kept her from going to church. And then the next week, she was headed up to Johannesburg, where she actually lives. She was just visiting down here. So hopefully she'll... I put her in touch with one of the brethren up there, and I hope they will help her to, to get somewhere and continue growing. The Friday night, or yeah, well, Friday afternoon, young people's class... I've been doing this pretty much the whole time I've been over there. Uh, I started it probably the first year I was there. And uh, it's, it's been a good thing. I don't know how much good I'm doing right now, but I think I've done some good with some of the ones in the past. And hopefully it's doing good for these. Uh, we don't have all the young people from Ashawi come to this. Part of the reason is... I have to pick everybody up. You know, it takes me about an hour and a half, and then there's an hour class, then take them home. And so from the time they get out of school, and you know, I'm already dropping the last ones off when it's dark, so it's just not practical to, to bring any more. But, uh, but the ones that come, I, I think they like coming, and they, they seem to get some good out of it. Now, that's, that's kind of the, my regular work. But I want to talk some, as we're talking about giving glory to God, I want to talk about some ways in which we've noticed the providence of God in these past years in our lives and in others as well. But one of, one of the things, it's hard to know what to call the providence of God because he doesn't spell it out to us. <laughs> but when you see something that works out with the timing, I just call it the providence of God and give him the glory one way or the other. And even getting stuck in America because of COVID, we didn't like that. We wanted to be back in South Africa, but there were some good things that came from it. My grandmother over here died during that time. And during her last week, Brittany was able to be her main caretaker. And that was a good blessing. And so that was a good thing that we were able to be here during that time. Uh, so that was, that was a good thing. The timing of being pregnant with uh, Malachi also worked out well. We, we wanted to have a child a little bit earlier. We, we were planning on, you know, going back to South Africa, having a child over there. We have to be pregnant while we're here, right? And... Uh, that didn't work out. Brittany couldn't get pregnant and didn't know why. And then we got stuck here. If we had been stuck here when she had to give birth, we could not have afforded that. <laughs> I mean, it would have worked out one way or the other, but, but we're thankful with the timing. Uh, and there were some riots that happened when we got back to South Africa, not because we came. They didn't riot because we came. But uh, later on, there was, there was a big problem where our former president uh, was arrested for corruption, and 
he had a lot of supporters that stirred everybody up, got the criminals moving, and started looting. And they would burn down a lot of shops, too, so I call it rioting. And uh, so that shut down our part of the country for a while, not too long. We didn't know how long it would be. And it was right around the time when Malachi was going to be born, and I was concerned that she'd have to give birth at home. Uh, I actually wrote to a brother in Sierra Leone who had uh, helped his wife give birth at home, and he sent me his notes. And I decided, if this is going to happen, I'm going to call our neighbor next door who's a nurse, because <laughs> I, I don't think I can do that. But we didn't have to, Lord, thankfully. The, the Lord blessed us. And, uh, and there were some other brethren who were giving birth around the same time Brittany was. And, and so they also, the timing worked out. The riots were finished by the time everybody had to have their babies. That Everybody could get to the hospitals, which they couldn't during the riots. They shut down the roads. So, uh, yeah. So, and then just... We kept getting exposed to COVID uh, you know, around the time of his due date. I would preach, and then, OK, my interpreter that was standing next to me found out he had COVID. The next week, same thing. <laughs> Different interpreter, but he also found out he had COVID. And so the doctor said, look, stay home. Don't go to church next time, because <laughs> uh, you, we won't let you in if you've been exposed that's, that soon. And so. We did. We actually stayed home that Sunday, the day before the birth. But uh, I was able to be with her, which, which was good. But along, along with that timing, considering the riots, uh, you know, we, we were living in town in a rented apartment. And you know, some of the, the rioting, the burning, and everything happened right across the street from where we were living at that time. But by then, we had actually moved in with my grandfather to take care of him, because he's, he's almost 93, getting to where he needs somebody with him all the time, most, mostly. And so we had moved in with him, and so we weren't really affected so much by it. Some of the brethren who also lived real close by, they were threatened. People threatened to burn their houses down, because they wouldn't let them uh, bring in their stolen goods and things to store on their property, but uh, but we we weren't really affected by it too much. Uh, and you know, the day that they started, we went to Margate or Avongo, that three-hour drive away. We had talked to people, some of the people who knew some of the ones involved in the rioting and organizing stuff. They said, "Yeah, we don't think it's going to start yet. I think you're safe to go." So we went. You know, they said, it'll start Monday. Well, it started Sunday, but it started after we got home. <laughs> uh, they shut down the roads, and Sister Majola in, in Ivongo couldn't even get to work uh, where she's a doctor. And uh, you know, she couldn't go for several days. And the people who were stuck there just had to keep working. It's pretty, pretty bad. But we were, we were blessed to get home uh, before that happened. And you know, we and the other brethren were all protected through these riots. And um, you know, there were some scary times, uh, especially you know, like Mzwandile being threatened uh, because he, wouldn't, he said, no, you can't store your stolen goods on my property. Uh, and, and then you know, his wife had nightmares for a while because of the threats to come burn their house down. But... You know, they, everybody was, was okay. There were, there were some threats against some of the Indian brethren, too. That was pretty scary. But, um, you know, there's not always good relations between Zulus and Indians in South Africa. And uh, so, so there was a lot of racism involved. But uh, thankfully, nobody among the brethren ended up getting hurt. And uh, this is just a, a picture of... Uh, behind our house where they set fire to the sugar cane. That was a little bit scary, especially for Brittany. I knew, I, I, don't, I didn't think it could get up to the house, but uh, I went out and put out some of the fire on some of the trees that were closer. 
found out I'm not a very good firefighter. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, 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 was, it ended up being all right. Uh, and everybody had food as well, which was a blessing, because they, they, they cleaned out the shops. You know, the looters just cleaned everything out, uh, and the shops were closed. You could not go buy anything uh, for several days. And so Brittany had just gone and made a big grocery run right before this happened, not knowing that this was going to happen. And so we had plenty. We rationed it because uh, we didn't know how long it would last. But we, we had plenty. We were able to share with, with uh, one or two other people. But most didn't need it. Uh, most were able to get food somehow. And uh, you know there were some. Brit Brittany called one sister. She said, we don't have food. But that particular day, you know, I contacted him, Zwandi Legazu. He said, there's a shop open in Richards Bay. It's about an hour and a half away. And everybody's going there to, to get food. So we put him in contact with the other brethren. He was able to take them with him. They were able to get what they needed. And, and then the, the day before the shops opened in Ashawi, a Muslim a charity came through and gave everybody bread. And... Uh, and so that was, that was really nice. You know, we weren't expecting it, and they came down the street, handed out loaves of bread, and we were very thankful for it. We didn't know the shops were going to open the next day, but we were out of bread by then, so it was, it was nice to have that peace of mind overnight anyway. So the Lord, the Lord can use whoever to bless people, and the, there's a lot of uh, the Muslim charities in South Africa actually do quite a bit of good, I just wish they would they would turn to the Lord, but uh, but they they do uh, help out people. So another part of the providence, more recently, is my grandfather uh, started choking the other day, just in his in his seat in his office, he, and he he almost died. He was blue in the face by the time Zippo found him. And Zippo is never there that early. Never there that early in the morning. But he was there that day, that early. <laughs> and he's the one who, who found him, and he knew what to do. And he and Brother Longa picked him up, put him on his side on the bed, and he coughed up whatever it was he was choking on. And, uh, and so you know, his wife is a nurse, which is helpful, but had also gotten some advice from my grandfather's doctor. Uh, about this is how a lot of older people die. And so he, he knew what to do. Uh, and so that's, that's helpful. We probably wouldn't be here right now if he had died because we'd be there taking care of things. He hasn't fully recovered from it yet. Uh, but he, he, the last message I got was that he, he's feeling a bit better, but he hasn't been able to go to church for several weeks. He's depressed about that. He used to teach every Sunday. Uh, even at his age, so he, he feels a little useless at this point, which he's not, but that's how you feel when you're used to doing something and you can't do it anymore. All right, and then we have, of course, opportunities the Lord has opened up for us. You know, he talks, we, we read about Paul talking about the doors that God has opened among the Gentiles. Well, these aren't exactly maybe the same as what Paul had, but one of the, the opportunities that we've had is online studies. Because COVID, as much damage as it did all over the world to God's people, as people left and never came back or became weak and all of that through that time, um, one good thing that came about is everybody got used to online classes. Well, that can be a bad thing, <laughs> depending on if you have opportunities to be in person, it's so much better. But you can uh, do some good with online studies. And so we, you know, I know some of the brethren there, they're, they're online in classes every day of the week. Uh, and and they're, because they, they want to grow. They're, they're learning to preach better. They're just, they're really wanting to, to, to grow in their knowledge. And, you know, I, I was able to teach some from here while we were stuck here. I, I was able to teach twice a week while we were here. 
And that seems to have been helpful for some of the brethren in South Africa and even some in America. Uh, but once we moved back to South Africa, I couldn't keep that up uh, for various reasons, but the, the timing just <laughs> isn't good and our internet connection isn't as good and all of that. But, uh, but it, the, the way that I was teaching, I don't think I could have done it. But we, we were able to do that while we were here, and then we were able to do other things once we got back. And, of course, the online studies that we have on Mondays, we're able to do that now. But we still try to get together about once a quarter in person because that's just much nicer <laughs> than online. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's so much better to be in person. And we get more students when we're in person, too. The, the classes are recorded. I don't know how many of the others that aren't in the classes actually listen to them. But we do have... Uh, somebody else who's been able to join the class who lives a little bit farther out uh, who wouldn't be able to do it if we just did it in person. So uh, there's, there's some benefits to that. And th this is the, the class, although the, my cousin Phillips in this picture too, he came out to visit us. And he taught the class this night. But this is when we were in person. Uh, the young lady on the far right, Jezzy, she's having a lot of health problems. Uh, I, I mention her sometimes in my reports uh, to pray for, uh, but yeah, she has blackouts and uh, I don't know at all, but they don't know what's causing it. And uh, she, she has a good attitude, but uh, it's, it's not, not nice for her. Uh, and then on Thursdays, we have online studies that I mentioned the 20-minute studies. There's some brethren up in Venda, we're from Venda, who got together and organized these. And then they were doing it for a while. They, they asked Chad uh, Brewer and, and uh, um, let's see, Dan Morris, yeah, from Montgomery to help them out. They have over there and worked with them. And, and then they, they ended up, calling me and asking me if I would help teach those too. So I've been doing that for a while. And, uh, and so that, yeah, since January 2022. Sometimes we don't have electricity, which means we don't have internet either uh, when in the class is going on. So, but we have a schedule when the power is going to be out, so we know ahead of time. And I can pre-record my lessons and put them up on YouTube, and they can play them in the class, and then if, if people have questions, there's other brethren on who can answer those questions. But uh, anyway, it, it seems to have helped some people, these, these regular classes, and uh, so I'm, I'm happy I can be involved in that. Brittany also has started doing online classes once a month. She teaches a ladies' class, and that's been able, that's enabled people who couldn't get together in person before to actually be in those classes. She was teaching them in person, but it was hard to get people to come. Uh, so she just said, well, others are wanting to be in these classes and can't come, so let's just do it online. And it's recorded for those that can't make it at the time. So, uh, so that's, that's been good. Every second Saturday of the month, she did one right after we got over here. She could teach it from here. So that's, that's been helpful, I think, as well. Uh, Brittany has been teaching the, the children's class, some in Ashawi, when we're there. There's one sister who's been doing it for years, and Brittany finally said, well, can I help you? <laughs> and she was very happy for the help. So Brittany has been, been helping out with that, and... I think it's, it's been good for those kids. There's some really smart kids in that class. So they pick things up very quickly. And uh, some other opportunities that, that we've had. Uh, we usually, in December, we have a gospel meeting, and we have preacher training at the same time. So what, what we do is, during the day, we get all these people come for the gospel meeting, and they come from all over. So... What do we do during the day, right? Why have everybody just sit around? I mean, 
I know here, at least in the past, when you have a gospel meeting, you have morning services and evening services, which is great. But yeah, we just decided uh, a few years ago, let's do preacher training during the day. And this past time, when we did preacher training, we said, well, most of the studies are good for women too. <laughs> so why don't we just have everybody who wants to come, come? There weren't a lot of ladies who came, but, but some did. And then in the afternoon, we did more the, the practice stuff where the men might not be as comfortable with the ladies in the audience as they're practicing uh, and being criticized and all of that. So bringing the ladies' classes at, at our home during that time. Uh, and then uh, yeah, Brittany's mom came over. Well, her, her, both of her parents came over. And they, they work when they come. They, don't, they come for the grandchildren, but they get put to work. Uh, her dad's an elder uh, up in the, the Gooch Lane congregation. And, uh, and her mom's a great teacher, apparently. So they, they, they ask her to teach when she comes. And the church in Phoenix, which is one I don't work with regularly, they have elders. They're the only faithful church I know of in the whole country that has elders. But they have really good elders. And they've got good, good teaching and preaching. They don't need me to come as much as some of the others do. But, uh, but they had Brittany come to teach ladies' classes, and they had me teach classes for the men. I taught about institutionalism and uh, authority, things like that. And then in April, they had a meeting uh, with different preachers, and they had me come and talk about uh, David and Goliath. That was nice to be with them again. So they, I, I get a few opportunities outside of my regular uh, schedule. Of course, I had to cancel my, my Saturday class to do that, but, uh, but we often have to put that aside for one reason or the other. Uh, students aren't always there. In, in June, I... Uh, they, I was invited up to a church I'd never been to before in Deep Kloof, around Johannesburg and Soweto. You might have heard of Soweto. It's a pretty famous, really big township of uh, Johannesburg. Had a big part in, in the stuff uh, about overthrowing apartheid and all of that. But anyway, they, they invited me up. I had talked to one of the brethren there on the phone a couple of times, and one of the, the men from Ashawi is working up there and worships at that congregation. So they asked me to come. And they, uh, what they did was they said, we're gonna, your topic is the one baptism. You're, uh, you can preach for an hour, and then there's a question and answer period for an hour. And we, we went over an hour <laughs> on the question and answer. You think about with brethren, right? Everybody knows everything about the one baptism. Well, you can know enough without knowing everything. <laughs> and I probably don't know everything. But I tried to lay a groundwork. One of the, the issues I, I knew was I was going to come up is, can you be baptized by somebody that's not a Christian? Because a lot of the brethren have the idea you have to be baptized by a Christian to be saved. Don't read that in the scriptures, do you? You, you, you? you read about the one who's being baptized and their faith and what they understand, all of that. And so I tried to lay the groundwork. What makes the one baptism the one baptism? And the very first question had to do with you know, who has to do the baptizing. Uh, and so it was, it, was, uh, it was a good discussion. I really enjoyed those brethren. I don't know if I convinced anybody, but they had a good attitude about it, about the study and the discussion, and it was really nice to be with them. So uh, one of the things that the brethren there did was feed everybody, and unfortunately on that Saturday, something they fed us gave them and, and a lot of us food poisoning. Um, that happens sometimes. And... Uh, Thankfully, I was able to get the eight-hour drive back home before it hit. <laughs> so again, I call that God's providence, because that, that's not a when you have food poisoning. So 
uh, I couldn't preach the next day, but we had another brother, David Gametti. He's just always ready. I called him Sunday morning. I couldn't even get him. I had to send him a message and just hope. And he taught the class, and he preached, and apparently did a great job. He, he's always prepared. He's one of the ones that goes to Nongoma to preach. Uh, so this is, this is a picture from that uh, lectureship up in Soweto at Deep Kloof. They had a lot of visitors. Their congregation isn't this big, but they had uh, a lot of brethren from around, and a few people that were not Christians came as well. The other speakers that I heard did a good job. I didn't get to hear the last lesson because I, I needed to, to leave to get back home. But, but it, was, it was a good meeting. They probably had about 200 on the Friday and maybe 150 on the Saturday. But I also want to talk about some of the encouraging about those things and his letters. So I think it's appropriate to talk about that. Uh, how does the Lord energize his work? What encourages his workers to keep going? And one of the things is visits from others. Brittany's parents come. My parents got to come uh, in July last year, and that was great. And, uh, and just having, having faithful people come, whether they're family or not, is really energizing. It's great to have, have visitors who have the same faith, and we can talk about spiritual things, and it, it's really great. Um, we, we got yeah, Brittany's parents coming, and then my, uh, yeah, her, I was able to go out to Port Elizabeth with her dad, and they're, they're having some difficulties in Port Elizabeth with preachers dying. So they, there's one preacher, Norman Simon, he couldn't preach for several years. He, was, he had a condition where his body was shutting down over the years, and he, he died just before we went out there. Um, and, and then Brother uh, Brian Allen had uh, brain cancer, brain tumor. He died from that around the same time, just a month or so before. And he was preaching in Port Elizabeth. Now, the, the church in Utenhague, where Norman Simon was, has shut down. Those brethren are driving about 45 minutes down to, to uh, Port Elizabeth and meeting with them, and I think that's going to be good for everybody. And so Ashley Husson uh, is the one doing most of the preaching there now. Uh, but this is, this is Brian Allen there in the middle. We got to visit with him and with Norman Simon on the trip uh, I guess I'm confusing trips. I apologize. I took another trip out there with my cousin later. They died right before that trip. They were both alive when I went out with Brittany's dad. And we, we got to, to visit with them and encourage them a little bit. And this is Norman Simon. Uh, he still had a bit of a sense of humor at this point, but he was, his mind was getting pretty slow. Um, and then we, we had Rob Buchanan and Bob Buchanan come in the same month for gospel meetings. <laughs> so Rob Buchanan preaches in South Africa in White River, and he's one of my favorite people. Just great guy, good Bible student. I get a lot out of him. And, and then uh, Bob Buchanan from uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, came over, preached at a number of places around South Africa. And, and was with us as well, and that was really encouraging for the brethren there. And then my, my cousin Philip came over with his two older children, and he's a preacher. He preaches out near Augusta, Georgia, in uh, Martinez, not Martinez, but Martinez, Georgia. And uh, he's a great preacher, uh, in my opinion. Of course, I might be biased, but <laughs> he's one of my best friends. But he, he's really good, and he's an artist. So when he preaches, most of the time he's drawing on the board, and people remember those lessons. <laughs> so it, And they're good lessons, really good lessons. Uh, and so we also went out to PE, Port Elizabeth, with him, and he was able to, to preach for them and teach, teach a class and, and uh, encourage those brethren. After the, the 
they had just had the, the preachers passing away, and uh, I was able to go out with him and just kind of be his chauffeur. But uh, but it was good good to have him and and uh, the encouragement that he gave. All right, so what? What is it that I want you to get out of this? First of all, I want want us to, to make sure that when we see something good that's being done in the, the Lord's work, we give God the glory. But the other thing is, I, I want you to see that uh, you could come too. <laughs> some of you. I know not everybody can. But some of you might think about actually coming over and visiting. That's, that's the scriptural pattern, and I'm not saying that anybody's doing anything unscriptural but it, by not coming. But when we, we read about it in the scriptures, the, those that sent the money, you know, of course, they had to send it by somebody. But they didn't just send the money by the person. They sent somebody who worked alongside them, saw what they were doing, and could go back and tell others. You know, it's great to hear me talk about what we do, Right? even though I'm kind of boring, but it's much better if it's one of you. If, if you can come and, and see, am I even being truthful? And sometimes people aren't. Uh, and you know, see if, if there's something that you can see that I don't see that I ought to be doing. That would be great. So think about it. If, if y'all want to, to come over, that would be great. We'd love to have you. Uh, and you'd not only encourage us, but you'd encourage all the brethren we work with. They love when people come over. Uh, it's, it's a great thing. And I think you'd be encouraged, too. And I, I was told I had to put this in there, Brother Prabhu. Uh, Luck Raj, who's at Pine Town, the congregation with five people, he, he said, uh, make sure that you invite people <laughs> because he said he's unemployed at the moment, has been for a while, but he says, I can take people around to preach. You know, to, I can take them. If they want to do evangelistic work in this area, I'll take them. He, he thinks that if mature brethren from here come, they can do more than what he can do on his own. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he thinks. And... I, I think you could do some good if you did that. So that's an open invitation from Brother Lakraj that if you can come and work with him for however long you can, he's willing to, to work with you and take you around and help you be effective in that work. All right. But yes, all glory belongs to God. In, in whatever work we do, whether it's here in South Africa or anywhere else, I'm nothing, really. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good preacher, but I can, I can look at what God has done, I can look at what he said, and I can help other people understand that. But if I'm, if I'm not showing people the things from God, then it means nothing. God is the one who is great. And... We want to, to make sure that we really understand that. Uh, any good we do, it's because God has taught us to do it, and he's enabled us to do it. One of the ways he enables us to do it is through you. <clears> through <throat> the support that you give, we are able to, to do this work that we do there. And, of course, that's true of preachers everywhere. But it, it's a wonderful thing how God has designed everything to work. Um, and, you know, there's, there's certainly people who do more effective work than I do, who work harder than I do in South Africa and lots of other places. Zwandile Gazu, I think Majola and Uvongo, those guys have energy that I don't have. And, and they just, they're just always working. Zwandile preaches on the radio and gets lots of contacts that way. He's just always studying with people. He baptized somebody else the other day, sent, sent a message saying that they had done that. And it, it's wonderful. And we're just working together in that work. You know, it, it's not, 
who can baptize the most people, but it's let's work together for the glory of God. Uh, and we're thankful for the grace of God. That's how we're saved, but it's also through his grace that we can do this work. Paul talked about being an apostle. He says, uh, I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, I'm not an apostle, but this work that I do, I am by the grace of God. I don't think there's probably many people here that couldn't do as good of a job as I do, but I'm there, and I'm able to be there, and it's, it's a wonderful thing that uh, we have that opportunity. So thank you very much. Um, I guess I, I didn't. I didn't ask now, uh, Brother Ellis, Brother Poe. Do you want me to give an invitation now and have a song, and then we'll talk about? I don't. I don't know if we we want to do questions and answers afterwards or not. But uh, wrap it up. All right. And you can ask me questions afterwards if you like. All right. I, I want us to to just open up briefly to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we, we find Paul talking about spiritual thinking. And in I, I want us to begin in verse 18. This is from the New American Standard. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. I don't know that there's anybody here who hasn't experienced suffering of some sort. Maybe the younger generation hasn't experienced a lot of it. I didn't when I was younger. Really, I haven't yet. But as we get older, we experience more and more. And we start looking more forward to the resurrection when we don't have corruption around us or in us. And, but that, that hope is only there for the children of God. It's only a hope if we're in Christ. And so if, if you're not in Christ, why not? Don't you want that hope? Don't you want to look forward to the resurrection? If our hope is in this life only, that's pretty miserable because we're all going to have really difficult times in this life. But when we're in Christ, we have something to really look forward to. If you want to have that hope, and you understand the gospel of Christ, you believe that he's the Son of God, and you want to repent from your sins and be baptized into his death for the forgiveness of your sins, tonight's a great time to do it. And you can do that right now while we 